Hi, welcome to the History Talks. I'm your host, Will, and this is Sebastian. Today, Sebastian is going to be talking to us about Otto von Bismarck. So, Sebastian, who is Otto von Bismarck? Otto von Bismarck is the father of Germany, the founder of the modern German state. And he ruled as Chancellor of the German Empire from 1871 to 1890. Um, he, he was born in, as a uh, Junker, which is basically a... Prussian nobility family, you know, ever since the reign of Frederick the Great, their political rights were very diminished, but they still were very strong economically and often held great estates. Um, and uh, Bismarck was born to one of these families. Uh, when he was young, he was, let's just say, the opposite of his older self. Because when he was young, he was a uh, college drunk, he... Um, he was quite a player, um, he attended a very fine law school, but attended in quotation marks, he never went to a single class, but he did have one thing, he was an excellent reader, like he could speed read r ridiculously well and still comprehend it at a much higher level. Okay, so he had a, this natural born talent to do that, but he didn't apply himself when he was younger. So what, what was it? Was there some event that caused him to mature and to, to want to, um, to do something with his, his natural talents and position that was given to him? Well, uh, two things. One, um, he, went, he decided he wanted to go into the diplomatic service very early on. Um, so he got a job um, helping, helping to um, incorporate the territory of Aachen into the Prussian state as that had been recently taken uh, after the Napoleonic Wars. Um, but while he was in Aachen, he, um, Aachen was a popular vacation spot for a lot of the English gentry and their daughters. So after uh, spending two, after overextending a river trip with one of these daughters by eight months, he was fired and, and in order to help save his and his family's reputation, he was volunteer, involuntarily volunteered for, the, for a year of military service, which, I mean, Prussians were required to do a year of military service anyway. And then, right as his military service was ending, his father died, and he inherited the family estate. Um, and, and what age was this at? So he, so we're talking like you know early to mid twenties, you know. Okay, early to mid twenties. That makes sense that this would be happening around then. And then also, what, um, where are we in the, or, or what year are we in at this point? So right now we're talking, you know, more like eighteen thirties. Eighteen thirties. Okay. He's yeah. Born, born in the early eighteen hundreds. By eighteen thirties, he's he's maturing into manhood. Yes. Okay. So um, when he inherits this estate, he at first is a little lost on what to do, but eventually, you know. He gets enrolled in a soil chemistry course, he reads a lot on uh, estate management, and he, um, you know, uh, ends up building up his estate into being, you know, one of the few that's able to survive some of the collapses of the agricultural market in Europe. Um, so he becomes quite... And when, when was that? What was the, agric the, the agriculture market in Europe? Uh, the was there a crash that happened? Uh, or be, as the as they were transitioning from you know more mercantilist noble based economy to a more capitalist economy, yeah. uh, some of the old older um, agricultural states were were collapsing. A lot of them were, hmm. but unlike them, uh, Bismarck was actually um, his estate was starting to succeed. Okay, so he was he was good at managing a state, and then I also thought it was interesting that you said that he was sent to law school, so that would have been, what, maybe the 1820s or 1830s? Mm -hmm. Because at that time, at least, I, tell me if I'm wrong, but I was thinking that the nobility, they were not normally trained in law. That was more of a, a middle-class profession, right, where, where people would, would learn. Um, and then, you know, the sons of nobility were typically trained to be military officers. Is, is that correct, or is, this, or is this sort of starting to be an era where that was changing? It was starting to be an era where that was kind of changing, um, because... Because, you know, we're transitioning into capitalism, so, um, you know. Okay, so it was more, it was more rather, although at the time, it, 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 you said where he was actually successful was in running an, an agrarian estate, right? Yeah. Which is normally associated with this, um, you know, this honor culture, this militaristic culture yeah. where 
or you own land and you command uh, soldiers, or at least yeah. that was that was what the higher status um, members of society did. And whereas they they would hire lawyers, for example, to you know to argue um, various things for them, but they were that was more of a middle class profession. So there, there started to be some shift there around yeah. that time, even though he was still part of the. It sounds like he was still part of the old elite if he was had this interest in running an estate and was and sort of had a natural talent or not sort of did did have a natural talent for doing that. Yeah. So, anyways, um, he gets married, and um, on his honeymoon comes the revolutions of eighteen forty eight. Now, the revolutions of 1848 are a topic on their own, but for our purposes... uh, Okay, so we fast forward to, what, another 15 years or so, right, to 1848? Okay. So how old is he at this point? Was he, he's in his 40s? Or, or I feel like he's, yeah, he's more like in his 30s, you know, he's getting middle age, you know. um, Okay, so he's, he's had a chance to mature some, see some in the world. Yeah. We come along, we have a revolution happens. So what is, what does he do there? Or how does this impact him and his So. So basically, in Prussia, how the revolutions of 1848 go is, um, the, is, the li- is the increasingly liberal population um, rises up and demands a constitutional monarchy. Now, the king um, of Prussia, Frederick William, he is kind of on the fence. Like, he, he likes having his power, but he also is scared of th- this mob of people. Um, but he also doesn't necessarily want to fire on his own citizens. Okay, he's frightened at the power they wield, because, uh, I'm assuming because of, um, well, he needs them. He needs them to be working for the crown in order yeah. for his kingdom to be successful, right? Mm-hmm. And when he, has, um, uh, when he has his people at his throat, essentially, it's, mm-hmm. it's not going to be successful, right? Yeah. Even if he has to use just fear and force to push them in line that can only go so far right yeah. they're only going to to if you have to coerce them they are only going to comply with that at the absolute minimal level they have to right yeah. so he, he uh, he's probably thinking well i want to have a population or i want to have a citizenry that that wants to be part of the kingdom that wants yeah. to contribute okay so after a conflict that you know there's some shots fired but it doesn't erupt into outright civil war um, eventually, the king promises a constitution. Maybe not the full constitution that the liberals wanted, but he did get. But they, he did give them a constitution and a parliament, uh, the parl- the Reichstag. Uh, this okay. Mar- and and the, they they had what they had the power to write laws. Uh, the it had some power. They had some power to write laws, but. The king also had some power to write laws, okay. and they both kind of had veto power. Right. So okay. it, the constitution in was kind of a compromise. Okay. Um. So Bismarck, uh, he, he doesn't like this parliament because Bismarck is a hardline, uh, conservative monarchist. He okay. he believes in the power of the monarchy, but eventually he gets elected to this parliament. And he, and, uh, mo- and okay. Well, who who can vote at this time? Um, mainly you know like the middle class, the upper class. Um, you know. Oh, so do they require what is, is it some sort of requirement like you have to pay taxes in order to vote? I think it's like you have to like. It's either I, I think it's something like that or no wait all people pay taxes. Um, hmm. it was. You have to was, own property. Yeah, I think it was like you had to own okay, a certain you have amount to own of property. Pro- okay, you have to own a certain amount of property. So there, well, that that's what I'm saying. It's interesting that it sounds like this um, legislative. It, it's the Reichstag, right? Yeah, the Reichstag. Reichstag. So the Reichstag was created mm-hmm. as a by uh, a liberal faction. Yeah. Who gained power, um, as and they wanted this as a check on the king's power. Yeah. Yet you have somebody who is a conservative monarchist mm-hmm. who is who is elected in this position. So there must have been, so there must have been um, at least some sort of um, somewhat significant faction that still supported the the old monarchy. Yeah. Um, in order for him to get elected, that's why I was asking about who was who was able to vote in yeah. the system. Yeah. Plus, you know, uh, plus Bismarck was really good at campaigning. Oh, okay. 
Like he ran, like he, it said he ran his campaign headquarters like a military base. Oh, huh, okay. So, um, yeah. Okay, so he's a very efficient campaigner, which yeah. is, which, which uh, matches up with the fact that he's Germanic, right? <laughs> it yeah. sort of, it goes along with the territory. Right? Yeah. So, um, so one of the first things he does is he, um, is there's this debate in Parliament about like, you know, um, about like increasing Parliament's power. And one of the arguments thrown up is, hey, you know, we threw back Napoleon so that we could, so that the people could control Prussia. We deserve a constitution. And Bismarck replies, the people of Prussia held back Napoleon for Prussia. They don't need a piece of paper to validate them throwing back Napoleon. And this causes outrage in the Reichstag. So what Bismarck does is while people are like, hey, that's that's anti-democratic, well, yada, yada, yada. Bismarck uh, finds a newspaper, uh, it starts leisurely reading through it, and then waits for everyone to die down, and then he just finishes his speech. <laughs> Anyways, so, event so the next elections come around, and he is not Ott re-elected, but he is, um, but he is still uh, politically active, you know, he's part of, he's one, he's gang, you know, like, influential among conservative party um and eventually he um and eventually the king frederick william dies and william um it becomes king of prussia now uh Biz Bismarck, what year are we talking about right now so this is like um 1850s 1850s okay but we're about to go into the 1860s okay so we so basically um bismarck in order bismarck is rising back in popularity so but william the first doesn't exactly like bismarck because bismarck because bismarck is um part of the faction that wants german unification hmm. okay um uh, so he's still a monarchist at this point but the monarch isn't too happy with him yeah because um at, at the same oh, time is it, is it because of wilhelm or is it william or wilhelm uh, this is uh Wilhelm the first. Well, this this okay. is a different guy than the previous guy. Right, I got you. So Wilhelm the first. So why would Wilhelm the first not want the unification? Is it because he would? There, there is another. Is because there's another claimant to the crown. Um, and another. Yeah, there's and, okay. Basically, there's two main powers within uh the German Confederation. Okay. Uh, Austria, Hungary, and Prussia. And okay. at first, it seems like Austria is the much greater power. And any unification would need to include them. Okay. Because, you know, they're a German-speaking nationality. They, the Habsburgs have controlled uh, the HRE for years, and that's basically just a German confederation. Okay. Logically, they should be the ones unifying. Um, so, you know, oh, um, Fred, so William is uh, not too happy with all this unification talk. So he sends Bismarck on... He, he points Bismarck as the envoy to Russia, mainly so that he can get Bismarck out of Germany. And then he moves him to Fr to being the envoy of France for some reason. Um, and there, and in France, um, Bismarck actually kind of starts to begin to actually respect, you know, some of this middle class, um, you know, type people. Like, he's starting to think, oh, okay, you know, maybe it's not just nobility that's good. Maybe I should, you know, start looking more into the merits of the middle class men. Um, and also, it's important to note that during the revolutions of 1848, um, France um, became, formed the Second French Republic, but that was soon replaced with the Second French Empire, because Napoleon's nephew, Napoleon III, was elected as the president of the French Republic, and then somehow got convinced the Parliament of France to crown him as Emperor of the French again. So, that'll come up later. Okay. Uh, so, Bismarck, um, he gets these diplomatic postings, but then, all of a sudden, he comes back to, he, he's ordered to come back to Germany and accepts a position as Prime Minister of Germany, hmm. which seems out of nowhere. Is this a new position? 
Or is it is that is that the leader of their parliament of the Reichstag? That's the basically the leader of the Reichstag, okay. head of government. Um, yeah, he gets a letter. Oh, from, he's a head of government, so the king is not. Considered. The king is a head of state. Head of state. I understand. Yeah. So the king. Yeah. So Bismarck gets a letter from the king saying, "Come back and become the prime minister." Okay. Which seems totally out of nowhere because this is the same Wilhelm that. Uh, sent him to Russia and France to get him out of Germany. Okay, so why would he want him back? There must have been some threat to his power, and he thought that um, Bismarck, because of his, his loyalty to the crown, was somehow going to be on the side. Is that what happened? Uh, so basically, so it all starts with the conflict over the budget and the military. Okay. Because um, Wilhelm I had some very important military reforms in mind um, that he wanted to get passed, but he would... But, the Liberal Party, who ha- had a majority at this time in the Reichstag, uh, did not want to give him an army grant, and the Constitution that they had said that said that the Chancellor and the Parliament had to both agree. Sorry, not the Chancellor. The King and the Parliament both had to say yes to any budget before they could collect taxes on that budget. Hmm. And, but neither of them could agree on a budget because uh, the king, he wanted, you know, he wanted uh, these military grants and the liberals wanted to decrease the military budget. And this brought them to the brink of constitutional crisis because the constitution did not spell out what they were supposed to do if they couldn't agree on a budget. Mm-hmm. It was just assumed that they would eventually compromise. Yeah. So, um... And one of the proposed plans in um, the king's cabinet was as to um, just send in the military to overthrow the parliament, but that would almost certainly cause a civil war. So Wilhelm um, was like, all right, here's my plan. This Bismarck dude, he might have a shot. So we can invite him back in, make him prime minister. If he succeeds, then he succeeds. That's good. Um, so, they bring in Bismarck, and his solution is to say, well, our constitution is incomplete, so we just need to do some interpretation, and since you all can't, since you two can't agree on a new budget, guess we'll just have to use last year's budget. So they, so for five more years, they keep collecting taxes on the old pre-parliament budget Hmm. that says that the military gets a lot of money. So that solves the problem, even if it doesn't make the liberals too happy with Bismarck. Okay, so really, essentially, he brings them in. That's that's what it always... So, so Bismarck and Wilhelm had some disagreements with them over a German unification, but mm-hmm. Wilhelm needed... He needed the, the monarch at this time. Is the monarch still the commander-in-chief of the military? Um, that's actually kind of what the the constitutional crisis was about because okay. um, part of the reason he wanted to get this military grant through was so that he could be in control of the military. Okay, so and he, a he large... needs to control. Okay. Yeah, that yeah. makes sense. So he needs to control the military. He knows that Bismarck is a dedicated monarchist mm-hmm. and he's going to back him in that regard. So essentially, they may have their differences over German unification, but they both have the liberals as their common opponent. Yeah. And that's why he wants to bring him back. Okay, yeah. That makes sense. So immediately, um, Bismarck Arc wants... So immediately after solving this domestic issue, Bismarck turns his attention to foreign policy. Um, and and he, what, he, what Bismarck imagines is a unified Germany, but one with its capital in Berlin, one that's under Prussian influence rather than mm. Austrian influence. Okay. So he has a few, So he starts with Denmark. Denmark has... So Denmark took two duchies in northern Germany... Schleswig and Holstein, that these duchies speak German and are more culturally German, but they were granted under a personal union to the Kingdom of Denmark as semi-independent duchies in a weird, complicated fashion. So, um, how, however, the King of Denmark, uh, the new King of Denmark, they had just gotten a new one, decided as one, as one of his first achievements, he would try to to um, incorporate the Duchy of Schleswig-Holstein properly into the Kingdom of Denmark. Hmm, okay. Um, no more, you know, special privileges. 
But this was in contradiction with a treaty that Prussia had signed with Denmark um, in a war they fought in the 1840s. Okay. Um, and this is this is all occurring in the 1850s. Wait, wait. Or the 1860s, Oh, the actually. 1860s, okay. All right. Yeah. Okay. This is all occurring in the 1860s. Okay. Um, so... This is occurring over in, in Europe while the Civil War is going on in the United States. Yes. Okay. Um, so, Biz, so Bismarck is like, hey, you're, not only are you violating our treaty, but you're oppressing Germans by forcing them to be fully incorporated into Denmark. So that gives us a casus belli to go to war. Mm. And thus, the, the second Schleswig War is declared. However, first, uh, Bismarck needs to make sure that the international community does not intervene because that was a mistake Prussia had made in the first Schleswig War. War. So Bismarck's uh, solution is to is first he um, make sure uh, France and Russia are you know totally cool with it. They're not going to intervene. Then he convinces Austria, hey, we're all Germans. We should unite to, um, you know, fight the, Dan the Danes who are oppressing the Germans. And Austria agrees. They join the war on Prussia's side. So they invade Denmark, and thanks to the, the, um, thanks to the excellent leadership of the German general Helmut von Moltke, uh, they make quick work of Denmark's army, and they overrun Denmark. Uh, forcing them into a peace treaty in like a year. Okay. So, he, so Bismarck faces a little bit of a problem because his casus belli was let's liberate Schleswig Holstein from Danish rule. Which, if he took, if he, if he had Prussia annex these territories, that would turn the in, international opinion against him. Mm. So his solution is at. At first, during the peace conference, he makes these ridiculous, absurd demands, and and makes the Austri and gets the Austrian uh, foreign minister to think, "Huh, look, Prussia's going to take some territory. I Austria might get left out. Let's negotiate a compromise that means we both get territory." So, so Bismarck ends up getting what he wants. He gets uh, Holstein to become part of Prussia. Schleswig becomes part of Austria, and they decide to have like a council to figure out what to do with it later. Okay. This, and also they get some uh, minor war indemnity. Um, and what this does is it makes it so that public opinion can't turn against Russia because Austria did it too, and they're going to have a council to decide I, what's going to happen later anyway. It's going to be fine. Yeah. Well, I would say public opin opinion can always turn. It can always be spun. There can always be a media campaign or some kind of other mm -hmm. campaign. But I understand what you're saying. It makes it more difficult. It yeah. makes it more difficult for them to... Um, it, it gives them sort of a morale or a, yeah. a appearance of being in the right. Yeah. And then this leads very quick... And this leads to Bismarck uh, orchestrating the Austro-Prussian War... So basically what happens is Biz is uh Bismarck realizes Austria might be able to rig this uh council I had to discuss uh what to do with Schleswig Holstein. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to prepare Prussia for a war against Austria, which is going to inevitably happen. So first he um, you know, make sure make sure Russia and Britain don't intervene. Then he checks with Italy, because Austria actually has territory that the Kingdom of Italy wants, namely Venice. So, um, Bismarck says, hey, there's going to be a war, so if you, um, not only ally yourselves with us, and, but, um, join the war on our side, then we'll let you have Venice. And Italy's like, sounds like a good deal to me. So then that just leaves France. Who Bismarck um says, hey, hey, you know, uh, why don't you be neutral? And the and France is like, 
well, we want to purchase Luxembourg. Hmm. So can wow. we do that if we stay neutral? Hmm. And, Bismarck's lo- and Bismarck kind of dodges the question, but Napoleon III takes it on good faith. How did he I- dodge the question? Um, I don't recall how he did that. He just like, uh, maybe, you know, just... Uh, he he refuses we're... to give them an answer. Yeah. He essentially says, we, we won't necessarily give you that, but it's best if you remain neutral. Yeah. He, he has the negotiating, he has the leverage in the negotiations yeah. here to be able to do that. Okay. Yeah, plus, uh, Fran- France, uh, you know, it's, it sees Prussia as, you know, what it was before the Second Schleswig War, you know, a minor power, you know, maybe one of the five great powers, but the least of the five great powers, it's, it's probably just going to give us this end anyway. They're probably going to get, let us annex Luxembourg, you know. Okay. So, um, the Austro-Prussian War, uh, breaks out. The way it's declared is the, the council, um, to decide Schleswig-Holstein said, says something that's against Bismarck. But Bismarck then says the council was invalid all along, and the German Confederation is also invalid, and uh, a state of war now exists between us and Austria. So now, since war or happens, it's Prussia, Italy, and a few of the northern German states against Austria, uh, Saxony, Hanover, and like a couple other minor states in the in Germany. And th- thanks again to Helmut von Moltke, they absolutely, they almost completely embarrass Austria. Like, Austria used to be seen as one of the greatest powers of, in uh, Eastern Europe, a uh, rival to only the Russians. But Moltke basically, he makes their massive army, like, you know, he goes to their massive army and just kind of absolutely destroys it in, in, at lightning speed. In fact, he's so quick that Bismarck has to rein the rest of the government in from going too far. Because if they, you know, completely destroy Austria, the other powers are going to be like, hey, Prussia is actually a threat. We need to form a coalition against Prussia so that Bismarck doesn't become the German Napoleon. Uh, so Bismarck uh, prevents the European powers from taking this opinion. By as soon as he, as they win the Battle of Königgratz, um, Bismarck sues for peace. Um, the peace deal he signs is he annexes all the Prussia annexes all the minor German states that were on Austria's side. Austria can't participate in any further Pan-German diets. Mm. Uh, the Wait, what is a Pan-German diet? Like something like the German Confederation, like okay. you know, a union of independent German okay. states. I understand. Um, Biz, uh, Prussia forms, uh, the North German Confederation, which is made up of Prussia and a couple German miners Mm -hmm. in Northern Germany that seem like they're gonna, that the populace wants to join Prussia anyway. Mm. Um, and Italy gets Venice. Mm. Also, the independence of Liechtenstein was re-guaranteed, because they technically joined the war or something. I... That's just a little side. Okay, so the border. So what year did this happen in? So this was eighteen sixty six. Eighteen sixty six, and how similar does the border drawn in eighteen sixty six? How similar does that look to the border of Germany today? Um, the only the borders drawn by this treaty are like you know just very similar to modern Germany. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. Is it essentially the same as today? You're talking about the main and, the main difference is. Einstein. Um, Venice is part of Italy. Yeah. Um, Austria is a separate state from Germany. Yeah. Um, you know, for example, it's, it sounds like it, it sounds very similar. Yeah, the main differences are in modern times, uh, Italy owns South Tyrol, and in modern times, uh, Germany does not own half of Poland. Okay. Um, oh, and also, you know, the, the Austro-Hungarian Empire doesn't exist anymore. Yeah. So anyways, after this war, North Germany is unified. That just leaves South Germany, which is much more reluctant to join uh, Prussia. You know, they're kind of like, eh, they, just, they just defeated our Austrian brothers, you know. We're not opposed to Germanification per se, but we don't really like Prussia. So Bismarck, is, Bismarck at first tries to do a campaign of like, you know, 
convincing public support in these countries, but they're not having it. So Bismarck decides he needs an external threat, and wouldn't you know it, France is the perfect example. Hmm. France, who is kind of mad that they did not get Luxembourg, after all. Um, so who, who got Luxembourg? Or is Luxembourg, did it remain independent? It remained independent. It remains independent, okay. Yeah, so France does not get Luxembourg, so Napoleon III is mad and has a short temper. But he doesn't, but that's not necessarily a casus belli yet for either side. Hmm. Plus... Bismarck knows that public opinion is more than likely going to be more in favor of the side that got declared war on them rather than the side that actually declared war. Okay. So, so is he going to, so is, at this point, does he want to provoke Napoleon III into war? Yes. Okay. So at first, it seems like there's an opportunity. He just handed to him because Spain, uh, oh, Spain, their monarch died, or sorry, not died, uh, was abdicated, so they need a new monarch, and they decide that the king's cousin, uh, Leopold, um, would be the perfect monarch for Spain. Um, and Bismarck is like, yes, we can get an ally with Spain, and that will force France into having two fronts. Um, <coughs> so, some secret letters are sent between the between the Spanish Parliament and Bismarck, and eventually they arrange a date to um, coronate uh, Leopold. But then a uh, cipher clerk makes an error that uh, where they put the date eight wrong, and they put it so far ahead of when Leopold would actually arrive that the Parliament of Spain was like, "We're not staying in session that long. Forget it." And then after they say forget it, um, uh, um, it Bismarck arcs, uh, you know, whole thing with Spain, it gets leaked to the public, and this gets France mad, mad, but not that mad. Instead, uh, Napoleon III just sends a diplomat with two requests, uh, one to withdraw the to withdraw the claim to the Spanish throne, which the king of Prussia was like, yeah, that, that's, not, that's fine, that's reasonable. But then, and the, the diplomat says, we want you to promise that no von Hohenzollern will ever claim the Spanish throne, ever. Hmm. And King Wilhelm is like, no, that's ridiculous. And the diplomat's like, all right, well, I tried. And they have a respectful goodbye, and they leave, and then, um... The king uh, sends a transcript of the conversation to Bismarck and permits him to send it to the press. So what Bismarck does is he, let's just say, omits some words from the conversation. Okay. Um, you know, he edits it a little so that when he gets leaked, so that when he publishes it to the press, mm -hmm. um, it sounds to the French like the king insulted their ambassador, mm. which uh, rallies up French public opinion, which is, in Napoleon III's mind, what he needs to um, get this war off the ground. Okay, so and Napoleon because... III, just to, just to go over this again, Napoleon III wants a war, and it's over Luxembourg, is that correct? Uh, no. What, no. What, 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 so, is he, what does he want? So Luxembourg got him mad, and then he realized that Prussia is actually kind of scary, because they just defeated Austria. Okay, so what he wants then is essentially to push back on Prussia's power, because Prussia is right next door. That, and he wants to fix some internal issues. Okay. Because Napoleon III, while he was, while he was excellent at industrializing France, he, he sucked in almost every other way imaginable. He um, gave up, like, a big chunk of Italy for, like, these two French-speaking cities on the border. Mm. His foreign entanglements were a disaster, mm. and public opinion was turning against Napoleon III. Okay. So he figured... If and he, he thinks maybe if he can turn uh, public opinion outwards towards an, an out, uh, an, a foreign enemy, that mm -hmm. that could help him. Yeah. Right, okay, so that's, Plus that's his he, motivation, right? And then, yeah. on the other hand, uh, Bismarck, or, or Wilhelm's motivation in fighting France is, what is their motivation? So Bismarck wants to fight France because he thinks he, because he's able to convince Bavaria and some of the other German states 
in the South, you know, hey, you know, maybe we can, if, if someone declares war on us, you know, we, you're going to join our war and defend us, right? And the German states are... Okay, so he sees this as a path to German unification, also yes. coming out with a common enemy, yeah. who is a, a foreign entity, is their common enemy. It, it leads to German unification. So they're both essentially looking for something internally, yeah. but projecting it outwardly at an outward enemy. Yeah. Okay. And then, so they really both want war and they're yeah. trying to provoke each other to get this public opinion so they can get it. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, Napoleon III declares the war, you know, because of the whole Spain thing, um, he, he's able to knock at the other powers intervene, but because he's the one that declared the war, the powers also don't intervene on his side. Um, and at first, um, it seemed, seems like, you know, oh, France has better rifles, and they have a descendant, they have a relative of Napoleon leading the army. Clearly, he, and plus, they declared the war, they mobilized first, mm -hmm. so, you know, maybe they should win. But, uh, how much, but the Germans still have Helmut von Moltke, and a little bit of luck. They uh, the luck just makes the war shorter, though, because okay. basically within the first year of the war, which was declared on eighteen seventy. Okay. Um, oh, they, so at this point, what when was Bismarck born? Around eighteen ten or so. Uh, probably more like eighteen twenty. Eighteen twenty. Okay, so he's around fifty years old at this point. Yeah. Okay. So um. So the so the war breaks out and um. And at, they have one of the earliest battles is the Battle of Sedan, or I don't know how to pronounce the city's actual name, but um, at, at the battle, the Prussians basically encircled the French, used their cavalry to destroy the French art artillery, and uh, forced a surrender. And, in, and, in the sur and guess who was personally leading the French army? None other, none other than Napoleon III. So now Napoleon III is a prisoner of, you know, Prussia, Germany. Uh, meanwhile, Bismarck is sending out referenda to these German states because, you know, their soldiers are also fighting in this war alongside the Prussian troops. Okay. So, you know, starts now back home, home in these states, you know, public opinion is starting to turn in a way that's like, you know, maybe union with Prussia is not so bad. Um, and... So, with Napoleon III captured, the leading officers of the old government are like, right, that's it. We're making a new government called the Government of National Defense, uh, also called the Third French Republic. Um, and they basically just exist for a year to negotiate with, with Bismarck. They, they're basically on their hands and knees begging, don't take any territory, it's going to start a socialist revolution. And I know you don't want that. The Bismarck just says, um, if you have we can help you crush a socialist revolution, just cave into my demands. Hmm. His demands being the annexation of Elsass Lorraine, which while not while the people there were slightly more loyal to the French, they spoke German. So Bismarck thought they would be fit for his German nation. Okay. Um he wanted an indemnity of like seven billion francs, mm -hmm. and um, and the, he would not, and the Prussian troops would occupy France until the full of that indemnity was paid, and uh, last but not least, the formal recogni recognition of Prussia uniting with the other German states to form a German empire, and after a year long siege of Paris. They eventually cave in, and all the demands are met. Okay. So in 1871, in the Hall of Mirrors, the finest room in the Palace of Versailles, one of the prides of France, uh, King Wilhelm I of Prussia is crowned Kaiser Wilhelm I of Germany. And it's a great ceremony. Bismarck wears a white uniform instead of his usual gray one for some reason. And um, it's just a splendid ceremony and an embarrassment to the French because it's, 
you know, in Versailles. It really takes place in Versailles, yeah. Yeah. But but Bismarck has, has achieved his goal of German unification at this point. Yes. Is that correct? Okay. That's great. Um, as How much does... does Bismarck go on to do a lot of other things after this, or yes. Okay, well, here's why I'm asking: is if we should if we should finish that in an episode two of Otto von Bismarck. Remember how we did two episodes yeah. of Napoleon? Let's do that. I think that's a great place to end right there. Yeah. Where Bismarck achieves his goal of German unification, he now has a king. He's a he was a um, loyal monarchist. He now has a king. He's he's seen crowned uh, as monarch, emperor as emperor of this unified Germany that he mm-hmm. wanted. So he's, he's really, and he's what, fit in his 50s at this point. So he's accomplished yeah. his goals. He goes on, what does he live to old age? And uh, goes he, on. He, he, uh, he becomes the chancellor of Germany up until 1890. Okay, so and, he's, got, he's got another couple of decades after this. So yeah, yeah. that definitely leaves, we'll do an episode two. Yep. But I think that's, did you have any final words you wanted to say for the episode one here? Um, Bismarck was... Um, Bismarck is called the father of Germany for a reason, and he may have been very pragmatic in his means, but he accomplished his goals and founded a German nation that would last, that lasts to this day in some form or another. Okay, that's great. Check in next time where we talk about uh, the Kulturkampf and some of Bismarck's domestic policy. All right, that sounds great. All right. Thank you all for tuning in. We will see you again in Otto von Bismarck, episode two. Mm -hmm.